Hi, I'm Rob Goh. I'm one of the co-founders of NextView Ventures, a seed stage fund here in Boston. And I'm pleased to be able to sit down with Len Schlesinger, uh, the current president of Babson College and previously COO of Limited Brands and Aban Pan and uh, also previously a professor at HBS. So, yep. Len, thanks for taking the time. Great to be with you today. So, you know, I want to kick off with a question from a Babson alum. Um, and uh, he asks... It seems like some of the most successful entrepreneurs, Michael Dell, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, et cetera, never finished the undergraduate education, let alone their graduate degrees. As a leader of an institution that is so well regarded for teaching entrepreneurship, how do you respond to the critics that say entrepreneurship either can't be taught, or even if it can be taught, you're better off spending two or four years doing something else, actually starting a company or working at a startup. Yeah, it's complete nonsense. Yeah. I mean, the arguments are complete nonsense, all the elaborations around this. I mean, the only thing I can take away from Bill Gates and uh, Mark Zuckerman, it mm -hmm. wasn't that they didn't go to college, it's just they dropped out of Harvard. So mm -hmm. why don't we say that that's the problem? Mm -hmm. the, um, uh, but the reality is um, there's a bunch of research on, uh, on incredibly creative people uh, that I've extended to entrepreneurs uh, that actually started with trying to understand uh, the evolution of the auction market for artists. Hmm. And what you discovered was there were two categories uh, of artists. Uh, there were the Young Turks, uh, the people who hit the ball out of the park the mm -hmm. first time, and quite honestly, the value of their work peaked with their earliest work and only went downhill over time. Mm -hmm. I think Andrew Warhol would be a good example of that. Uh, and then there's Monet. Uh, and I always encourage people who want to understand what I'm talking about to go to the Monet exhibit in Paris. Okay. Hmm. Uh, and to actually start at the beginning of Monet's work and to take it through the chronology and, and ask them to experience. So what do you think about this early work? Well, it's uh, not that good. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that precise, and it doesn't have a point of view. And, and by the time you get to the end of his career, the work is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about two different phenomena. Mm -hmm. I am not suggesting that there aren't magnificent people who come out of the woodwork, who are born for destiny. Mm -hmm. okay? uh, and we don't understand much about that. Okay? I'm also suggesting that's not in the business that I'm in. Mm -hmm. okay? I'm in the business of, uh, of educating people in a method, uh, giving them multiple opportunities to practice to build their skill base, okay? uh, and increase the probability that they can be successful in using that method in a world that's increasingly uncertain. Mm -hmm. So the issue is, uh, is I'm not engaging in denial that there are extraordinary characters in every profession, mm -hmm. and entrepreneurship is just one small right. part of it. The problem with that ethos and the problem with that logic is it discourages millions of people from engaging in entrepreneurial activity, and that's bad for the world. Mm -hmm. So I travel around the world, I get up you know, in the middle of the night because I got jet lag, and I turn on Bloomberg, and what do I get? I have a half an hour of the Mark Zuckerberg story, a half an hour of the Bill Gates story, a half hour of the Steve Jobs story, and then I'm mightily depressed, mm -hmm. okay, because I can't teach people to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, it's, a, it's, a it's a ridiculous proposition that's set up. Now, the second piece of that is there's a whole generation of entrepreneurs uh, who hit it, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, the first thing they do is hire a ghostwriter and rewrite their life. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I've looked at some of our famous entrepreneurs where there have been carefully documented historical studies of their venture creation mm -hmm. and then their celebration of self, uh, and the overlap is often the null set. Mm -hmm. They write these books saying, I'm hoping that my story will encourage you to become an entrepreneur, and in fact, it does just the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, it acts as a major exclusionary force because people say, well, I, I'm, I'm just not Richard Branson, or I'm not Steve mm -hmm. Jobs, or I don't have the big idea, mm -hmm. uh, or I don't have millions of dollars, or I can't afford to be hanging from a mountain by my fingernails having levered every dollar that mm -hmm. I have. That's not what real entrepreneurship is about. And so I'm trying to uh, make entrepreneurship as inclusive as is physically possible. That doesn't mean that people that engage in entrepreneurial methods, the entrepreneurial behavior, by definition are going to do startups. Mm -hmm. okay? uh, the method is applicable to a broad range of activities, much broader than, uh, than uh, startups. And here at Babson, we call that entrepreneurship of all kinds. The story for me, and the best example of that is the Peter Thiel taking 20 people oh, out yeah. of college uh, grant, will never discover how good they would have been okay, had they finished college. 
because uh, I look at them, they're all extraordinary people. Right. And so there's no risk in giving them a year off. Mm -hmm. The notion of celebrating this as a, let's show you what people can do by not going to school is just silly. Mm -hmm. So how about, let's talk a little bit about uh, graduate schools, right? So sure. somebody who's been out of school for a few years, you know, they've done work in whatever field, and they say, because you know, I get this question all the time, they say, what should I do? Should I go to business school or an entrepreneurial focused business school and learn about entrepreneurship? Right. Or should I either forget working on their own idea? Should I join XYZ startup that I'm excited about and learn through mentorship and experience? Yeah. So the, so the answer differs dramatically by the context in which somebody's coming to mm -hmm. the equation. I'm not saying graduate education and business slash entrepreneurship mm -hmm. is for everybody. It would be absolutely silly to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But the reality is we have a portfolio of programs at a place like Babson. We have that full-time, two-year intensive MBA experience that is designed to provide one framework. Mm -hmm. We have a one-year model that for people who have already gotten some business education that accelerates that process. And then quite honestly, we have an evening program and we have a, a fast track program that allows people to turn that either or that you uh, mm -hmm. are outlined into an and also, mm -hmm. where you can actually learn, pursue those activities, engage in those processes, uh, and be able to use your educational process to reflect on that and figure out how to do it better. Mm -hmm. it. So I'm going to ask a very typical VC question. Um, you have, as a president of a university, you have competitors out there, some very well-funded, very well-known Harvard's MIT students yeah, yeah. of the world. How do you compete? How do you win? Yeah, it's so simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, uh, and, and I laugh about it because mm -hmm. I got here, and uh, so I've been here now almost four years. I was around campus for four months before I got started, and so I did the obligatory kind of connect with everybody. Mm -hmm. So I lived off the campus. I had an office on the south end of there, and I would see anybody, so mm -hmm. I saw a hundred faculty, I saw the vast majority of the trustees, so just dozens and dozens of students. I sat in classes to really try and understand what this was all about. Mm -hmm. And what I saw uh, was a school that uh, interestingly uh, deserved in a variety of different ways its number one ranking uh, for entrepreneurship mm -hmm. at the undergraduate and the graduate level mm -hmm. against an august, uh, an august set of institutions uh, that are far wealthier and far better mm -hmm. known than us. And I said, like, this is really a phenomenon. And I also saw an institution that lived in dire fear of what happens the day that somebody announces that we're number two, three, or four. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and one of the things that you learned uh, in business school, mm -hmm. and I learned in business school, and I taught and did as a manager, is to understand at the core, being number one isn't a strategy. Mm -hmm. right? it's, you know, it's, it's an outcome, OK? Uh, and so we need to shift our orientation from being number one to quite honestly, uh, what we understand from strategy is the only defensible, defendable position for us uh, as an institution of higher learning that has a full-time faculty of 180 and 325 acres of campus that we own. Uh, we're never gonna be a low-cost provider. Mm -hmm. right? So given that that's out of the neighborhood, what do we do? The issue is to get a meaningful, differential, differentiable proposition and to ensure it's sustainable. Mm -hmm. So our strategy actually comes from Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead, who when he asked about what, how did Grateful Dead become the phenomenon it was, they said, well, it's not because we were the best musicians. It's not because we had the best voices. It's not because we had the best lyricists. We were the only band that took our fans seriously mm -hmm. and our fans responded. Uh, you're awfully young to remember these things, but at Grateful Dead concerts, okay, as opposed to every other concert on the face of the earth that said no photography, no recording, no nothing, uh, at a Grateful Dead concert, the best seats in the arena uh, were reserved for people who came with tape recorders uh, so they could actually record the concerts and engage in an underground economy mm -hmm. supported by the dead to exchange concert tapes with no, uh, with no profits to the group at all uh, accruing. And they turned that into a phenomenon. I want to do the same thing at Babson, okay? I want to be the only school that does what it does. So we're the only school that clearly articulates entrepreneurship as a method mm -hmm. uh, and documents that. Mm -hmm. And at the faculty level says we all teach under the umbrella of this method that embraces the institution, entrepreneurial thought and action. We're the only school that's quite clear about the fact that that method extends across a broad context. Startups, mm -hmm. the things that you and I tend to talk about in entrepreneurship, high impact growth enterprises, the parts that really are creating the jobs that we keep mm -hmm. talking about, 
uh, family enterprise. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we come back from uh, a Davos where everybody is talking about the crisis of legitimacy for the public corporation, and that's quite real. Uh, but why isn't anybody talking about the power of family enterprise, okay, since that's a greater concentration of wealth than the public corporation that has the flexibility and the ability to take the long view mm -hmm. and actually reshape capitalism as we understand it in the world. We started 100 years ago, almost 100 years ago, as a family business institute. We were designed uh -huh. Huh. for the sons of Roger Babson's economic forecasting clients to actually give them literacy and uh, to get them to the point that they wouldn't embarrass the family when they came into the business. We're connected to virtually all of the substantive family business dynasties in the world, given our history. So there's a great opportunity there for leverage. Fourth, obviously, is large organizations. Mm -hmm. And the half-life of a Fortune 25 company now is a decade. Uh, they're either transacted off the list or they're beaten by an entrepreneur. Uh, and those predictive organizations are having extraordinary problems trying to do meaningful innovation and entrepreneurial activity within the four walls of the enterprise. Most of the prescriptions that are offered to them by large company folks are structuralist in nature, and they don't work because they systematically ignore, okay, mm -hmm. ignore uh, the logic of differentiation and integration. The more you hive it off, the more the political and cultural issues you'll have bringing it back together. We've got to figure out ways to stimulate entrepreneurship within the enterprise. Not We know how to do it outside. Right. And then finally, we have the questions of social innovation. Now, lots of other schools say, we have entrepreneurship, and then we have social entrepreneurship. And I'm saying, no, we have entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Social innovation is a foundation of entrepreneurial activity. If you accept the UN principles for responsible management education, we have a responsibility to manage for outcomes that go beyond uh, economics. So the reality is, A, we have a method. We're the only school with a method. B, we have a much broader context, what we call entrepreneurship of all kinds. We're the only ones who say that method transcends all of those settings, and mm -hmm. we think we can demonstrate it from a research perspective. And third, our objective as an institution is to impact the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so whether it's Harvard or Stanford, MIT, these are great institutions mm -hmm. that have resources, faculty, and capabilities we can never, ever, ever hope to have. They're great schools. I have nothing but the utmost of respect for those institutions. They just can't do what we do. Okay? Uh, and uh, as a VC and as a student of businesses, as you look at the plans, you understand better than anybody that the focus player wins every time. So the simple definition for us, when people say, how do you do it? We end up saying, you know, we do it by being the only school that does this, the only school that has a method, the only school that's brought in the context, the only school that is explicitly focused on doing this on a global scale. And we don't think that anybody is going to be able to pick that off. So tell me about the method. Mm -hmm. What's the, uh, you know, for, for people, especially for people who are, who are watching this who aren't from Babson, what their sure. appetites? You know, what, what is the... Uh, so the good news is, is, uh, is it's not like we came up with some marvelous new invention. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a new hair wash or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, the reality is in 1983 when Peter Drucker wrote uh, Innovation and Entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. uh, he basically said this notion that entrepreneurs are born uh, and, and not trained is mm -hmm. just nonsense. He, he used the word discipline. He said entrepreneurship is a discipline like any other discipline. It can be documented and it can be learned. Mm -hmm. okay? uh, and we have very much taken that to task. Uh, when our faculty uh, was very clear uh, about wanting to differentiate our roots in entrepreneurship, the discipline, which mm -hmm. is historically how our reputation was built, you know, we have 50 faculty in entrepreneurship. It's larger than most business schools. And wanted to shift that orientation to saying, no, no, we all do what we do. We teach OB, we teach finance, we teach production, but we teach it under the umbrella of this method. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then it really required us to engage in the systematic debate in the community about what that method was. Uh, and when was this actually? This was my first year. Okay. Okay. So we actually agreed coming out of the faculty conversations that we would do that. We brought lots of people to the school. We did lots of reading and lots of talking. And one of the people who had the most powerful influence on us is a professor down at the University of Virginia mm -hmm. uh, named Sarah Sarasvarthy. And she was a doctoral student at Carnegie Mellon. She was actually Herb Simon, the Nobel Prize winning economist, last doctoral student. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and Herb Simon always had this uh, perspective uh, with doctoral students of doing these cognitive science protocol analyses of professions to see if, in fact, the way in which people thought and talked about their actions in a given profession bore any relationship to the 
logic that was being uh, explicated by the literature and by the professional institutions. So a perfect example of that was until the late 60s and early 70s when people asked what managers do. Mm -hmm. okay, you know what the answer was? Managers plan, organize, direct, and control. Hmm. That was it. And then Rosemary Stewart and Henry Mintzberg and John Cotter went out and said, well, let's see that. Let me see, what time do you plan? Nine to 9.15? Nine you know, when do we organize? From 10 to 10.30? We direct at 4.45? Mm -hmm. That bore no resemblance to the messiness, the complexity uh, of a manager's life or how he and she or she thought about their day and what they were trying to do. So, uh, so uh, observation and interaction gave us a much more robust perspective. What Saris did was bring together a portfolio of successful serial, serial entrepreneurs across a broad spectrum of size, mm -hmm. from a couple hundred thousand dollars to billions of dollars, uh, and took them through an exhaustive series of conversations about how they thought about a variety of managerial and entrepreneurial mm -hmm. problems and how they would act. Uh, and then did that with a mere mortal population and discovered, lo and behold, there was almost no relationship between what we were writing about entrepreneurship uh, and how they thought about it. So we're celebrating in all of the magazines about how entrepreneurs take great risks. It doesn't appear they want to, they, they're constitutionally oriented towards taking risk uh, at all. Okay? And many of them are quite skillful in syndicating risk away entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about entrepreneurs as if they're lonely, you know, solo practitioners. The vast majority of entrepreneurial activity engages in groups, and mm -hmm. the literature didn't support uh, that at all. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about and teaching about business plans. Mm -hmm. okay? uh, and increasingly, we've come to recognize that I'm not completely throwing out the logic of business plans, but it does have a time and a place, and it's useful for you because it can shorthand your oh, interactions really with business. Plan. Yeah, that's a perfect example. <laughs> you know, our conclusion is increasingly to get people involved in business planning activities too early in the process uh, generates a high level of commitment to stupid ideas that haven't been vetted. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we need to modify the process. There was a piece uh, recently published in the Wall Street Journal about how we do this work. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we have a venture accelerator, not an incubator. The last process, the last part of the process is putting together an implementation plan, not the first part mm -hmm. of the process. Uh, and that matched completely the way entrepreneurs were talking about themselves and what they were doing. Uh, finally, they're absolutely unwilling, these entrepreneurs, to engage uh, in prognostications or detailed research about a phenomena when you can actually go out and experience it. Mm -hmm. So they started with themselves and their, their means, who they are, who they knew, what they knew, okay? rather than their goal of some big picture idea. Uh, they were willing to assess what they were willing to pay to play up front, in other words, how they manage their risk based on desire and their sense of the opportunity and the time frame, uh, rather than obsessing about expected return, given the fact that you can't calculate expected return when you have an idea, which is a right. speck of an idea. They bring other people along, okay? Mm -hmm. So they co-create with stakeholders of all kinds, and in fact, Saris does a magnificent job of uh, really being able to document that co-creation process as the elements of market creation, okay? Uh, whether, it is, uh, whether it's ambassadors and people who are enrolled into your idea or people you're selling mm -hmm. to, uh, and recognizes the dynamic when people come with resources, they generally come with ideas, uh, and the dynamic of how the resources and ideas shape with the entrepreneur to actually, uh, to actually create businesses. Uh, and then most fundamentally, uh, you know, the literature now tends to celebrate, uh, to celebrate it as failure, and now we're all going to create a generation of people who will learn from failing. Uh, the world is not culturally yet ready to talk about failure mm -hmm. as a, a desirable construct, as much as you and I mm -hmm. would think it was. Uh, the issue is, how do you learn, okay? And, and, uh, and uh, they learn through action. Mm -hmm. uh, they take a step, okay? They moderate, may moderate the risk for that step. They see where they are. They assess current reality. Uh, they decide if they're continuing to willing to pay to play, and then they take the next step. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's much more a continuum of small steps than this big idea, a home run business plan that's overfunded uh, and with lots of people. It's not the way the world works. So we've come back, and we, we had that research and other stuff, and we went to our faculty and said, well, you know, you know what you teach, and you know what you believe. Let's systematically, as a community, 
assess the current streams of research and the current streams of practice, and get to a Babson point of view. Mm -hmm. And that's what's resulted in this book, The New Entrepreneurial Leader, mm -hmm. um, that uh, three of my colleagues co-edited, but more importantly, 21 faculty members contributed to mm -hmm. in terms of really expl explicating what this method looks like for the school uh, and for the broader community. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of things about it that are unique. One is it says it's the new entrepreneurial leader. It doesn't say it's about entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it's postulating that the new entrepreneurial leader is the form of leadership that is most likely to be successful in terms of being able to adapt to the environment that we're part of. So that's number one. Number two, only two of the faculty that wrote in this book teach entrepreneurship. Uh, and so everyone else is teaching a functional subject, mm -hmm. and that gets back to my earlier notion of uh, evidence that we're the only. Mm -hmm. You're never going to find a school where every academic discipline contributes to a book on entrepreneurial leadership. You're just not going to find that. Uh, and it really became the framework by which our, our community organized itself into then assessing through the normal curriculum review processes that are underway uh, at the undergrad level and have been implemented at the grad level. Mm -hmm. So, based on what you're telling me and what I've read, actually a little bit about the method, isn't it just like the lean startup movement? Yeah, no. no? There's yeah. a lean start. The lean startup movement purports to be science. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and uh, and so uh, so it, it, my answer is mm -hmm. equally unfair. Well, mm -hmm. first of all, our book came out a year before his. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'd sit there and yeah. say the lean startup. Isn't that just like what Babson says? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, but to be fair, yeah. the, the concepts were published. Yeah. Broadly They're all at the same time. So time, yeah. so there are pieces of lean startup that uh, that I think are very powerful and are mm -hmm. completely consistent uh, with what we talk about, mm -hmm. which was. Instead of perfecting a product, mm -hmm. get your minimally specified product out into the hands of customers and friends and see what they do with it and mm -hmm. see what they say about it and see where they go with it. I could not applaud that more. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, The notion that all of this gets architected into a rigidly defined business map mm -hmm. okay, uh, that can subject itself to classical statistical process tools, I think dramatically overstates the mm -hmm. case. I mean, I think there are pieces of it that can. Just as there are pieces of the world that are uh, that are empowered by the Toyota method, mm -hmm. okay, uh, but the higher the level of uncertainty, okay, the more likely you're going to have to rely purely on interaction with consumers and friends, mm -hmm. okay, uh, and less on uh, on the ability to codify this into a rigorous process of next steps. Mm -hmm. So I think it overstates the science part, mm -hmm. but at the root uh, is is dealing with exactly the same logic of get it out there and see what happens. So I think this focus on action has led to an interesting phenomenon, at least I've seen, among business school students in tech internet startups, right. which is uh, a desire to either learn how to code right. uh, or at least get d dangerous doing that. And yeah. is that something that you emphasize, you know, sort of a fluency and you know, yeah, ability to actually use technology? So I got here three yeah. years ago, four, four mm -hmm. years ago, and I still remember my first spring going through what was then our incubator. Mm -hmm. Uh, and discovering that 75% of the businesses that were getting incubated at the time uh, were Web 2.0 businesses, mm -hmm. and that we didn't have a single course. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, uh, and now the reality is, um, I'm not interested in people having uh, deep coding experience as part of their college experience, and there are easier and better places to go get that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do I believe that people need to have a higher level of technological literacy in order mm -hmm. to be able to, to even think about the opportunity structure? The answer is yes, and we're materially invested in that. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, if you want to learn to do an app, okay, uh, we've actually discovered the best way to teach someone to do an app, which is we have a senior mm -hmm. uh, who is running a peer learning program and That's is right. teaching, a, teaching a course on how to design an app. And I guarantee you, his course will be better than anything a 50-year-old faculty member will come up with. Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that that senior is around next year? In the well, the, the reality is, in an environment where you teach entrepreneurship and you try to live entrepreneurially, mm -hmm. uh, peer learning is going to be a central part of the agenda. Mm -hmm. And when you have a diverse community of 2,000 people, you're going to have always going to have somebody who can do that. Okay. Uh, so related to this, too, what do you think of um, accelerators, like Y Combinator, Techstars, yeah. uh, programs like that? <sighs> well, you know, they, they're taking on a religious logic uh, mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that this is better than that. The bottom line is we live in a world where I'm actively, uh, ideologically and practically supportive 
of any educational endeavor, mm -hmm. okay, in any environment that is designed to uh, increase the likelihood that people are going to choose entrepreneurial activities, whether it's a startup mm -hmm. or not. Uh, so I, I am an equal opportunity celebrant, mm -hmm. okay, um, uh, and uh, and believe that uh, I'm much better off. Um, uh, recognizing that uh, there aren't enough resources in the universe, and the last thing in the world I should say is don't do this and do that. Mm -hmm. So any place that's able to amass resources in the marketplace uh, that is committed to enhancing entrepreneurial activity, I support. Okay. So you talked about entrepreneurship in, in broader context, mm -hmm. such as startups. Um, what do you say to the alum who is working at a Fortune 500 company right. and says, you know what, I, I buy this process, but I'm stuck in an organization that is all about, you know, as you say in, in one of the books, you know, sort of a predict predictive process yeah, yeah. as opposed to, you know, entrepreneurial process. Yeah. So um, I, have, I have an article in the March issue of the Harvard Business Review okay. that deals exactly with that mm -hmm. question because, uh, because the vast majority of the interactions I have with adults, mm -hmm. okay, tends to focus on that question. Mm -hmm. So it tends to focus on uh, uh, in a, a reality base that mm -hmm. basically says my organization isn't interested in this, ain't it awful, ain't it awful, ain't it awful. Mm -hmm. And so the reality is I think we need to engage in a diagnostic to understand how awful it is. Okay? Uh, and some of that diagnostic goes back to basic fundamental principles that anybody would have learned in any management course uh, about it's not just about being a leader, but it's about being a subordinate. Mm -hmm. And how do you understand the pressures that are impinging on your organization, and most particularly the pressures that are impinging on your boss? Mm -hmm. Okay, and how do you use a deeper appreciation of those two sets of activities as an opportunity to creatively try to take action about something that is of interest to you, mm -hmm. that is likely to be of interest to your boss uh, and to the organization in a way that starts out being incredibly low risk. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, as opposed to just walking away and just saying, what was me? Right. Uh, you know, if you're completely convinced that there's no way you can move forward and mm -hmm. that you're seriously uh, hampered in your life and your career to be able to do that, you ought to find someplace else to work. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so shifting gears for a second, you know, I'm sure you interact with students all the time and mm -hmm. alums who, who come back. When you talk to, to students or alum, what are the you know, top you know, one to three lessons that they say, you know what, you know, I really took this away from Babson, and yeah. thank God it, it yeah, yeah. changed the way that I, I do business. So the, the absolutely number one issue mm -hmm. uh, that comes up time and time again is thanking, thanking us for stopping them from overthinking a problem. Hmm. Okay? Uh, you know, so the fundamental logic that we have here is really very simple, which is uh, in, an environment, uh, in an environment like this, the world that we're in, uh, where you can sit around and study a question from here to kingdom come, uh, you have to assess whether or not that is more worthwhile than actually going out and, mm -hmm. as Scott Cook says, use action to create the evidence that will allow the scientific method to work. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, we just keep telling people, A, just get started. The second piece of that equation is, uh, is very much part of language, and we're hearing it time and time again, Stop obsessing about uh, what you're going to do five years from mm -hmm. now. Okay? Um, I just wrote a blog piece uh, last night uh, about the standard interview question mm -hmm. uh, of, so tell me, where do you see yourself five years out? And I'm saying, do you know where you see yourself five years out? I mean, what is the point in this world? Mm -hmm. okay? uh, uh, the, the notion that, that someone is... Uh, going to be so ignorant of all of the variables that are likely to impinge on his or her, uh, him or her, that they can say, five years out, I'm going to be doing this in this kind of organization. And one of our faculty members here nailed this uh, and said, it's not what you're, stop obsessing about what you're trying to do long term and keep focused on what you're going to do next. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and again, uh, people get paralyzed by the magnitude of what am I going to do out there? Mm -hmm. Uh, and liberated by the notion of what am I going to do next. Okay? Uh, and so they're deeply appreciative of that. And then the third piece is those action orientations get layered on top of a basic, solid, functionally uh, excellent education. Uh, and uh, there is absolutely no way uh, that entrepreneurial instincts can substitute for understanding that two and two is four. Mm -hmm. okay? There's no way 
that verve and zeal can substitute for an understanding of cash flows. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and uh, and so, but the ability uh, to do that work uh, underneath that umbrella is really our power and what seems to be most appreciated by alumni when they're surveyed as they graduate. Mm -hmm. And and are there criticisms that you hear often that sort of shape how you? Th you know what you think are some of the major goals that you have for the university in the next. Oh yeah, I get you know. So, so I I get the, the, there are three basic criticisms, mm -hmm. and these are personal criticisms, okay. not institutional ones. Okay. okay. So the one is that I've so manipulated the phrase entrepreneurship, okay, mm -hmm. that it no longer has any meaning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and again, remember I talk about entrepreneurship, the discipline, entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. the method, and I talk about entrepreneurship of all kinds. Uh, and uh, and uh, most of the time when I'm, I'm talking about that expanded view, I'm talking about the method, uh, and I am clearly um, a disciple of Muhammad Yunus when he says, we are all entrepreneurs and too few people get to practice it. Mm -hmm. So I believe in my heart of hearts, I wake up every morning seeing a straight line between what I do and the possibilities of a better world uh, by engaging in the broad scale democratization of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Uh, rather than keeping it an exclusive, uh, an exclusive club, uh, and so I get criticized uh, both inside and externally for doing that. But at least I'm explicit uh, uh, about the point of view. And then the third piece is uh, is what is this entrepreneurship uberalis? Okay, uh, and I think I've answered that question for you, which is it's not uberalis. It is uh, it is an overarching logic and method that sits alongside. Uh, the scientific method, mm -hmm. okay, as a complementary logic, okay, uh, that dramatically enhances our ability to act. Mm -hmm. So I'm not rejecting anything that comes out of deep analytics. I'm as big a fan of deep analytics as you could ever have. Mm -hmm. And if you thought about uh, the vast majority of my work in a $10 billion company, mm -hmm. I have to tell you, most of it was in a predictive space, right. okay? Uh, now, the issue is, can you dramatically increase the effectiveness of an individual by developing what our faculty calls cognitive ambidexterity uh, around both of those platforms and to be able to turn it into an and also. Uh, I believe that's really hard work. Okay? I believe it's work that violates the fundamental beliefs of a lot of people that were trained in the scientific method. Uh, and it's a battle I'm delighted to fight.